Okay, it's time, and I will start the session, uh, start the talk. Um, so, uh, I am Ryusuke Masoka, a research principal with Fujitsu System Integration uh, Laboratories, uh, and I'm chairing this talk. Um, and uh, first, a few uh, housekeeping notes. Um, so, this talk is TLP White, and uh, please mute your phone. And uh, Q and A will be at the end of the talk, and uh, there are stand, standing mics uh, over there, and over there. Yeah, and uh, so, um, and uh, so the speaker is uh, first uh, Piotr Kuelski. Sorry. Hope uh, I did a uh, decent thing. Uh, Piotr makes things happen as the Shadow Server Foundation CEO and also coordinates large scale data collection, uh, analysis projects, and Shadow Server CSAT relationships. Uh, he has a strong CSAT background working at NASK in Poland for 14 years at the Third Polska team. Uh, he was the head of the third Polska team uh, from uh, 2010 to 2016, where he expanded the uh, sensor project, malware analysis, and malware disruption capability. Piotr's uh, interests include uh, threat intelligence, incident response, honeypot technologies. Uh, he's a member and ex-director of the honeypot project as well as the botnets and malware networks, which he likes to disrupt. And then uh, here's a Dave uh, D. Costa. Yes. Uh, Dave D. Costa is the internet spelunker for the uh, Shadow Server Foundation and has been involved in the internet security for over 20 years. When he's not scanning the internet, he can find him doing things not online. So uh, the title is uh, Internet Spelunking, IPv6 Scanning, and Device Fingerprinting. So the stage is yours. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to be back giving talks in person again. Um, the talk is about internet spelunking, so essentially our scanning and how we uncover new strange objects uh, exposed on the internet. The talk will be given by two of us uh, uh, together with my, my colleague, uh, Dave, Dave DeCoster. Um, a very quick intro, Shadow Server is a nonprofit uh, working to make the internet a more secure for all, which is kind of like a never, never ending task. It's an American and Dutch nonprofit foundation. Um, we've been around for, 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 for 15 years and we, our mission is essentially to share information with internet defenders at no cost uh, to mitigate vulnerable vulnerabilities, detect malicious um, activity, and counter emerging threats. We do this for free. We don't sell anything. Um, we are funded exclusively through sponsorships, grants, and donations. And uh, if you're able to support us in any way, we would very much appreciate it if you like, if, if of course, you, you like our work. We are about to launch a Shadow Server Alliance, uh, of a group of like-minded organizations uh, as a way to ensuring our future um, stability from the financial perspective as well. So we've been around for a long time and uh, we are probably the world's uh, largest provider of free cyber threat um, intelligence. We collect a lot of data sets. Um, this is data sets uh, scanning. We scan the internet and that's really the subject of the talk. But we also sinkhole, disrupt a lot of um, botnet malware or other uh, uh, malicious uh, cyber crime and some, sometimes state uh, activities with, and we disrupt and take, take over um, uh, the command and control infrastructure either through uh, a court order, working together with law enforcement or with industry. Um, we also run vast honeypot sensor networks uh, in thousands of locations worldwide. Uh, we run a big malware repository that's comparable to, to any antivirus vendor with uh, 1.7 billion unique malware samples by hash. And in all in all, we have 12 petabytes of storage of various types of information that we collect. And what we do with all of this is that we share this for free um, with the community. So if, if you're a national CSERT, you get the data that we see every day for your country. If you're an internet service provider, you get 
data for your network every day. If you're a corporation or an SME or a university and you signed up with us, you can get our data there for free um, every single day. So if you haven't subscribed to our services, please do. Uh, there is no, no catch here. You really get data for free. And we hope you do something um, good with it. We also use the data to support law enforcement operations. Like uh, we work together with the FBI, Europol, and many other um, national, national agencies in long-term multi-year um, cybercrime analysis um, and takedown um, operations. So uh, the focus today is about our scanning. Um, Dave will really talk about how we actually do the scanning and um, also uh, how, we, how we got into IPv6 scanning. And then at the end, I'll just, to, to wrap up, I'll take over and talk a bit also about how we actually fingerprint devices um, remotely thanks to all, the, all of this um, scanning. So, Dave. Thank you, Peter. So, on an average day, we report 149 million IP addresses um, that are, these are unique IP addresses that we find in our, um, in our data sets from the, from the scanning. So, uh, it's not a small number. So, to get that number, we do approximately, well, 107 billion UDP probes, 225 billion TCP uh, SINs, and we perform 407 million full handshakes. And th those, those numbers are probably small, but close enough. So, first, the uh, ground rules of how we do our scanning. We make sure that our scans will not compromise, harm, or degrade system performance. We always, we will always, always, always use the smallest, most minimal packet size possible to get our results. Two reasons. First of all, we don't want to make a mess of your firewall. And second of all, it's more economical for us to send small packets. Um, and we will test. We will never, ever, ever, ever take a packet or a probe and just fire it across the internet blindly. We'll always make sure that it's tested. It's tested in a, uh, in a uh, private environment, in a live environment. It will always be tested. And before we even do a full scan, we will do what we call one shard, which is one two fiftieth of the, uh, of the internet. And on top of that, we will only scan what is necessary for, uh, to get the information that we need to let someone remediate their system. Uh, so we also, also look for a specific ports used for our criminal, criminal infrastructures, which uh, law enforcement finds useful. And our scans will never, ever, ever break the, any US laws. Um, that is your red line that we will not cross. So how did we get here? No deed goes unpunished. We can all thank Christian Rochel for, for publishing a very, actually it was a very good paper. Um, but the problem is, is that this opened the door for people actually, it made it easy for people to realize how to do uh, reflective DDoS scanning. So we started with one of the protocols out of, I think there are 14 on the list. Uh, we started with DNS because people were already doing it. It was easy for us to do, and the miscreants were already abusing it. Um, and also allowed us to double check our work. The first scan that we did, it uh, was, very bad code. It took uh, 91 hours to complete. We found 16.9 million um, DNS servers on port UDP 53, and we found one, I say 12 and a quarter million of them to be openly recursive and vulnerable for abuse. Uh, the scan currently takes four hours, and we're down to six million total uh, responses, and we have 1.8 million re uh, recursive resolvers. That's now, that's a, that's, that, was a, that was a reduction of 10 million IPs. Great, it worked. Um, so after we discovered that, you know, this, this wasn't just a terrible idea with, uh, with a here, hold my beer, we could do this. Uh, we got more hardware, more bandwidth, we wrote new tools. So that's how we got down to the four hours. And we proceeded to implement scans on the rest of the targets. And everything was great. And then somebody came along and discovered that um, poodle. That was a very bad thing. And we, said, we were asked, can you scan for, uh, do TCP scans? And we said, sure, we can do TCP scans. Discover that doing UDP scans is a whole lot easier. Um, UDP, you know, you spray attack packet out there and you're good to go. And you don't really have to do much. You decode, a pack, you decode the packet and life is happy. Uh, since it's TCP, you have to do a SYN scan, then you have to do a follow-up scan afterwards, and you also have to decode the HTTPS. That's expensive compute-wise. But it took us a bit, but we were able to do it. And November 2014, we have sent out our first report uh, with 15.5 million IPs that were vulnerable to down downgrade attack. Nowadays, we're down to 2.3 million. It's still big, but it's getting better. But, you know, we really couldn't let it just sit because it's only 11 protocols and I had a very large pile of hardware, so well, we added a few more scans. We are currently at 103 uh, scans on IPv4, and we're at 10 on IPv6. And yes, I realized that, oh, actually, you can read that. 
So to choose our next targets, we don't just throw, no, well, actually, well, sometimes we do. We don't usually throw a dart at a dartboard, but um, it's usually try to be topical about it if it's something that's interesting. Uh, so it's like when in the days before like Netus with the uh, Netus botnet stuff and the uh, amplification attacks there, we chose, chose to do that. Or things like um, Sinful Knock, where you wind up with a, uh, with a nation state implant, or uh, Benign Certain on uh, ISA KMP. We started looking for things like that. And we also look for legacy protocols that shouldn't be exposed, things like you know Telnet, RSH, things that just don't have encryption. And also for current things that shouldn't be exposed, um, you know, Mongo, uh, say MongoDB, Kubernetes, MySQL, uh, Redis, or the other reason, actually, probably one of the biggest reasons that's actually scanned for something is someone actually asked us. Someone sent, a, sent us an email and said, hey, do you know how many of these are out there? And usually we're, we're a curious bunch of folks, so we look. And sometimes we find good things. Usually we find a lot of bad things. But for some fun facts, with daily repeats, we have sent 209 trillion UDP probes. I updated this this morning, so it's probably pretty close. 221 trillion TCP SINs. 500, so we have performed 508 full protocol connections. That means uh, HTTPS, uh, just the full, full handshakes there, MongoDB, anything, anything along those lines. And we have sent 287 billion uh, services for remediation. I apologize in advance for the noise. Because, well, I'm sure I'm at everybody's firewall. If you've seen me, that's me. If you're not, then someone just look at your firewall a little harder. So to get all this done, we have a very large rack of gear. We are currently scanning from 37 servers. There's a uh, combination of uh, pancake boxes and, uh, and blade servers. We have uh, two uh, 10 gigabit lines that uh, get very rather heavily abused. And we have five uh, IPv4, uh, say five slash 26 and one slash 24 on IPv4. And we perform scanning from one, uh, one slash 64 IPv6 block. And these are probably the dirtiest sliders on the net. Uh, the nodes are assigned 15 IPv4 addresses and 33 IPv6 addresses so that we can bounce around a bit and let's say bounce around within constraints and at least make sure that we don't, um, that we don't trigger too many uh, IVSs because we hit everything from one IP. The methodology that we use for scanning, the TCP scans are scanned differently than UDP scans. Um, our TCP scans are broken into shards. Um, a shard is one 250th of the internet, and we randomly do a random seed using ZMAP. And uh, we use the entire, I'll say all, uh, all 37 nodes to actually scan from. And those are performed using, the, using pretty much open source software. Our UDP scans are monolithic, which makes life interesting. Um, they are, each, each scan is run from a, uh, from a single node and is performed using custom software. Oops. For our UDP scans, our custom software is something named Railgun, mainly because, you know, you throw one packet in there and we send it out really fast. So it's designed to send a, like I said, designed to send a single packet randomly really fast to all 3.4 billion packets and tries to randomize them as fast as possible. It's tuned for doing small, small payloads. It can do large payloads, but it gets very cranky. Um, it will send packets using all 15 IP, uh, IP, IPv4 addresses that we have available on the box. But the only downside is, is that it has very few safety measures. If you want to shoot yourself in the foot, it will take your foot off. Uh, usually we can scan for the internet if, in about four hours for, for any given packet. Uh, something like ISA KMP usually takes about six just because of the packet size. And it's also highly dependent on the number of things that actually respond to us or if somebody decides to DDoS us in the middle of a uh, scan then things take much longer. The TCP scans are done by commodity tools. Uh, we, do our, we do our assignment of jobs using uh, Condor, which is uh, commonly used in, a, um, in research environments. So we use that to farm out the jobs as needed to boxes that are idle. The actual scannings are performed by ZMAP because it does, it does its job quite well very quickly. And we use ZGrab or ZGrab2 for the, uh, for the back end for most of the things. And we have a few other tools for doing, uh, for doing custom scans just because things get strange or they require multi-steps. Uh, each service takes between 10 minutes and three hours. Depending, I say that's, uh, the time is highly de dependent on the uh, complexity of the scan. Things that don't require uh, crypt cryptography, like Telnet, um, sometimes FTP, but those take, uh, in the human times, it takes eight minutes, say eight minutes end to end from 38 boxes. And if on machine time, it takes three hours and 57 minutes, which isn't too bad. But things with cryptography, um, the, the longest scan that we actually have is HTTPS. Um, that is much slower. 
It requires two hours and 29 minutes in human time, which equates to full two, uh, say a full two work weeks, uh, 82 hours in machine time. But the reason that HTTPS is so slow is because that it is a, uh, it is a combination of a straight up HTTPS scan, a uh, scan for SS, uh, say SSL v3, uh, TLS version 1.3. Um, we're looking for uh, for export ciphers using what's called, what's called the freak scan, and we are also looking for ex uh, looking for exchange servers. And it's also a portion of the Kubernetes scans that we do, which is why it's so long. And then after after things are run, the data is all parsed. We check for protocol uh, specificity. We sanity check it to make sure that nobody is throwing bad data at us. However, if somebody decides to spoof data at us and sends it at that, at that in uh, ways that are actually protocol uh, compliant, that causes issues sometimes, but we have solutions for that too. Everything is normalized and it's shipped off to the data center to get turned into reports. So we have frameworks for dealing with pretty much for IPv4 scans, IPv4 scans that make it pretty easy for us to spin things up. Everything was going swimmingly until one day, Piotr goes, we have a, we want to scan IPv6. And my first response, and I think uh, was actually, and I quote, are you nuts? He says, no, 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 we have an idea. And an idea he did have. So after doing a bunch of research, um, IPv6 is like, just like IPv4. There's a lot more of it, but not quite. It's a little quirky. Um, you can't really scan it from end to end, so we use, uh, we use queries and curated lists where we source them from SSL, SSL certificates, hit lists, and other places. And we are currently scanning about 814 million IPv4, uh, IPv6 addresses that we have determined are fully, actually currently in use. If we would want to actually blindly scan the IPv6 space, um, it's highly infeasible. Since IPv6 space is 3.48 times 10 to the 38 unique addresses, its time to scan would be roughly two times 10 to the 25th years, way longer than I have patience for. So we use curated lists. We're using, uh, we're using passive DNS records from uh, some of our partners that share data with us. And we're using the IPv6 hit list from the, uh, from the IP, IPv6 hit list, uh, github.io. Uh, certificate transparency seams, sinkholes, and other partners. And if you have more data, we'd love it. The um, differences are that V4 and V6, um, you have to use a different tool. It's uh, one created by the uh, Technical University of uh, Munich. Uh, they have a ZMAP version that does IPv6, does a great job. Uh, ZGrab and ZGrab2 have native IPv6 support, which is awesome. But there are other tools out there. Uh, yeah, they, they don't exist. It has the, uh, we suffer the same problem that every other security vendor has, um, where the tooling for, uh, for incident responders and defenders just doesn't exist in IPv6 spaces. Uh, so that's why if you, if, you, uh, if you happen to receive a report, you'll notice that the IPv6 data does not contain things like, uh, like the TLS version 1.3 uh, scans, because while I can do it, I do not have a tool to do it fast yet. Um, the other problem, thing, problem is, is that IPv6 scanning is much slower. We have to do much more general timings than IPv4. We can't just slam pack us out and hopefully get stuff back. Uh, IPv4, we've tested that the um, when we're using ZMAP, the, uh, the potential packet loss begins at about half a million packets. But when we use IPv6, the potential packet loss begins at about 100,000 packets. The reason for this is just sheerly the packet size. Um, the default, the minimum packet size you can actually have in IPv6 is 1,280 bytes, if I remember correctly, which is uh, substantially larger than IPv4. So the processing time to actually send it, route it, get it back, and do something with it is just causing, just causes a bunch more overhead. Likewise, if we're using, uh, if we're using uh, concurrent senders to, to actually, you know, actually uh, like splay, our, splay our scans and actually do things multiple times at once, IPv4, we can, do about 30, we can test about 35,000 uh, IPs at a single time. IPv6, once again, we have the same problem with the packet overhead where we start losing data at about, 15, at about 1,500. The average number of IPs that we can actually process, we can process roughly a quarter million IPs a second with IPv4. But once again, we, f we see that our speeds are dropped by about probably a uh, fifth, uh, say we dropped about a fifth to about 58,000 IPs per second. It's doable, but it's annoying. And the other interesting thing is, is that even though they're using different protocol stacks, IPv4 and IPv6 scans do not like running, auth running at the same time on the same network interface. Your machine will hate you, trust me. Uh, to get around this, we have, uh, we're actually routing, routing those on separate IP addresses and separate uh, VLAN spaces that 
that route back into the same uh, network. Our current IPv6 scans, we're doing SSL, SMTP, Telnet, SSH, HTTP, a couple ports, MySQL, FTP, and Postgres. And the responses are sizable. Um, the, biggest, uh, the biggest surprise actually was HTTP, and uh, HTTP being so large that one in eight IPs that we actually scan responds to HTTP. And when we look at the packet header, the, uh, the, the, uh, the page that we get back, a lot of them actually appear to be just default pages. So the best that we can figure out is that people are firewalling themselves for IPv4, and they don't realize they have IPv6 uh, services running. MySQL is so large, there's one, uh, there's one vendor that has a, uh, that has a, that has MySQL appear, apparently uh, enabled on every, every VPS that they have. We're not sure why, we've contacted them and haven't gotten any answers back. But some other interesting is observations that we can make from the IPv6 scans is that with SSL, the things in IPv6 have much better security on them. There's very, 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 very few things that actually have uh, the really old ciphers. So, it's not common that when we run a uh, when we run scans for uh, for poodle uh, for poodle that we actually come back and don't see a single one. Usually we see one, maybe two, maybe three per day, but that's it. Um, on FTP, we are actually see greater uh, see greater adoption of uh, of encryption. Finally, and MySQL. The other interesting thing that we find that with the the one thing that we find is that in forty two percent of the hosts um, that have MySQL running. They actually have some variety of ACL or block list, but, on four, oh, but only 4% of the same hosts on IPv6 actually have block lists. <laughs> and as we look, look at our population scans, we have with the uh, bulk of the in use, we'll say, let's call it in use IPv6, is we don't really know exactly how much there is actually assigned versus usage. But our best guess is that I say the, the bulk of the IPv6 usage is actually done, performed in the United States, followed by Denmark, Germany, and then the Netherlands. However, if we looked at thing, things that, are, that we consider exposed or vulnerable, the leader is still the United States. Not a surprise. Uh, but then we switched to Netherlands, Germany, and Singapore. But I'll leave it at the IPv6 scans that we have currently are small, and we'd like to make them bo uh, like to do more. If anybody has data that they would like to share, it us, share with us so that we can actually scan the uh, IPv6 space more, we would love to, uh, we'd love to have it. And now, Piotr will tell us what he actually does with all that data that we actually collect. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, the lesson here, I guess, from the IPv6 is that if you think you run IPv6 and nobody will find you because it's not possible to scan, then I'm sorry, they're wrong. If we can find them, then the bad actors can also do so. So all the data that we collect from, from all the scans, uh, we actually set on another mission to try to identify all the devices that are out there accessible on the internet. And by devices, I mean essentially anything that is not a, uh, a desktop server, a web server, we don't, we don't focus on that. We want to focus on, let's say, let's call it IoT, but a very like, wide definition of IoT where we can get firewalls and, and home routers and all that stuff as well. And the idea is basically that since we are running these 100 scans and we have a lot of um, patterns that we can collect, right, banners, uh, strings, um, uh, this kind of information, we can actually match all these responses or try to match all these responses and see if we can identify uh, the make and model of a device that is out there on, on the internet. And we try to classify them by type, what type of device, is it a router or a, or a NAS or an IP camera or, or, or something else, right? Uh, we try to classify by vendor, model, version, and assign it to a sector like is it a consumer device or is it an industrial device or, or just, a, just an enterprise one. So we implemented a scan rule engine. So think of kind of like a, kind of like a snort for all responses coming in. And it basically classifies all the scan data from, from Dave here as he submitted, submits it to the Shadow Server Backend API. And we, we plan to have like tens of thousands of these rules, but because we have limited uh, uh, processing power, human processing power, which actually needs to, we need humans to code the rules. We have currently around 1,200 only, but it does give a pretty good overview already of what is out there in, in various places. So we classify currently devices from, from uh, 173 vendors, and that is basically up to 30 million um, devices daily. And we started sharing out um, this, this information daily also with the community. 
Um, the idea being that you know you should know really what the devices are in your in your co uh, constituency if you're a CSERT, so that you can respond adequately to any threats or vulnerabilities uh, that are found in these devices. So you can have like immediate access to 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 this knowledge coming from us without having to design a whole new scan all of a sudden for Confluence or or Fortinet firewalls or or, or whatever, right? So we have actually a GUI for this a graphic interface where we can actually code, um, code the rules and observe their usage um, over time. Um, that makes it pretty easy to, to add new data set, new rules either uh, by uploading um, essentially bulk uh, rules or just coding them, uh, coding them manually. And we typically focus on various SSL uh, certificate attributes, um, the common names there, organization names there as well. We can uh, we scan HTTP, so we can just look at HTML body content and search for search for patterns, HTTP server names, cookies, SNMP, sys desk, sys name uh, fields are, are very good. FTP, telnet, SSH banners are also are also good at at help at classifying devices, and actually many many more. And there's more going to be coming in as we try to enrich our scans. Uh, to collect more of the information that we need, such as like following redirects, where you can actually uh, follow an initial redirect and, and obtain more information um, that is relevant uh, to, to a particular device, where essentially a login screen, quite often there's a redirect to a login screen, for instance. So we're currently missing that, but, but essentially, well, we plan to add it and I'll enrich our, our, our data um, as well. So the rules are really, really simple. It's just a, question, it's a, just a Boolean expression uh, where we try to specify various fields and then, um, and then make a statement. Uh, uh, we basically assign values to various fields based, uh, based on this um, um, Boolean, Boolean expression. So for example, uh, if we want to identify iRobot Roomba vacuum cleaners, and there are actually 400 of these worldwide um, exposed on the internet, imagine that. Um, we can actually look at the issuer common name, which starts with uh, uh, the Roomba string. Issuer organization name is iRobot, right? And we assign that this is an IoT tag. A device type is a home appliance. We, that's the level of granularity that we do, but it's a vacuum cleaner, right? Uh, device vendor, iRobot. Device model, Roomba. Device sector, consumer. And we build rules like this. Sometimes you need multiple rules for certain devices. Um, sometimes you just need one rule uh, to, catch, uh, to catch everything that's exposed. So, Essentially, it's a kind of like a never-ending task where you just add, pile on the rules as new devices appear or, or new scans appear, which give us um, a new insight. So if you're interested in Roomba vacuum cleaners, there are around 400 out there um, uh, around, around the world. There used to be 700 a year back, so it's dropped a bit, so something must have, must have changed, but we didn't really look into that in a lot of detail. Philips, Philips Huey devices, you know, the smart lightning systems, on, on the internet, there's actually 5,300 of those smart lightning systems, uh, pe stuff people use in their homes, um, uh, exposed on, on the internet thanks to, to, well, that's what we learned from our scans, most, uh, most in the US, but also quite a bit in, 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 in Scandinavia um, as well. I guess it's dark quite a lot of times, so it's, it's good there. Um, we also looked at uh, many of the industrial control system devices like PLCs, they, all, they also have classic internet protocols enabled, right? So web servers enabled or, or SNMP enabled, this kind of thing. So for instance, we are able to identify 500 devices just based on their uh, non-native. So this is not based on, on the S7 uh, protocol, but simply on, on, on other protocols that are exposed out there. We actually also started industrial control system scanning that enables us to identify many more of these types of devices, but this is just a stat for, for the classic um, um, HTTP or SNMP, uh, essentially internet protocols, but S7, 300, um, 500 devices um, exposed uh, outside, mostly Germany, um, United States, and, and Japan, as, as you can see here. Um, Microtic is, is a device that is the favorite of, 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 uh, <laughs> of many of us, as, as many of them are, are typically, um, uh, are their, their favorite targets of, of, many, of many actors that use them then for subsequent attacks, whether it's like DDoS or, or for tunneling to hide, hide their activities behind, behind various proxies. So we are currently introducing more and more scans, so also microtic dedicated scans, and we find every day uh, over three million uh, essentially exposed microtic devices, um, with uh, most of these, many of these actually being in, in places like Brazil, 
um, especially, but well, also the United States, uh, countries in Europe, um, and, and, and Asia. So that kind of gives us also an insight into, we've, we've started also looking at, at, um, at honeypot data and trying to match what devices are actually attacking the honeypots as well so that we can get a quick overview of, 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 of the hacking activity going on at, a ver at um, various points um, in, in time. Fortinet firewalls, for instance, uh, Fortinet is, is, is the most prominent firewall that we actually detect in, in our scans. There are 1.4 million devices. Um, so basically, you know, if, if, if you know where these devices are when there's a vulnerability in a, in a firewall or VPN service, which is usually pretty critical, of course, uh, we provide you the data for your constituency um, that basically provides you like pretty good situational awareness of um, who, is, uh, who is in danger where. And uh, well, the interesting thing about all of this is um, that you know, we can change our way of thinking about not just the internet as in open ports or services, but essentially as in devices, right? And different countries, different networks have different profiles and devices based on whoever um, they ended up purchasing from. So uh, think of a country's cybersecurity as being determined essentially by the effectiveness of a sales office of a, of a vendor in a, in a given country. And I also had to look at some of the vendors like, and see if the amount of devices that, they, they have, uh, that we can see um, actually correlates even with the location of sales offices. So we had like a US county uh, breakdown of certain vendors and you can find that quite often the amount of devices that are present um, in the counties are, there's an office of, of a vendor there. So, so this is how you know, the cybersecurity posture of a country or your network is, can actually be, um, be decided, which is, which, is, which is interesting in itself. So most of the devices we currently identify by country, uh, most are in, 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 in the United States, um, not surprisingly Canada, interestingly Brazil, there's lots of stuff exposed in Canada but probably shouldn't be exposed. Um, the top vendor we detect is Cisco, then Huawei, um, Microtic is, is, is third, then we have Sajumcom modems, um, uh, Fortinet firewalls, Asus routers, um, et cetera, et cetera. So there'll be more and more stuff added here over, over time. Um, the stuff we are doing here is actually an EU project, and if you want to see more results from, from this project, from us and from other, other partners, you can visit varia.eu uh, to get more data and um, including um, data sets that you could actually use uh, for, 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 for other work, um, like the statistics that I'm presenting, I'm presenting here. Um, a lot of our work is going to be also made public. It's not just shared operationally, with, uh, but we're actually going to release a new dashboard, um, which, which you can visit. You can get a preview here. It's uh, with a password now, but it will be public um, shortly, so feel free to take a photo. Uh, Password username Alliance. Uh, the username is Alliance. The password is Safer Internet with a capital S and a capital I. Um, the, it does contain uh, information about a lot of our other uh, data sets. Uh, it's, this is just the first iteration. We'll have some more stuff there. Uh, we don't have the device information there yet, but we do have the scans, including IPv6 scans, so you can get basically a live view of your country and even a region. Um, within, within a country. Um, it's not down to the AS level because we don't really want to make that public, but, uh, but you can at least get to the regional, um, regional level. Uh, finally, um, if you would like to receive this data for your constituency, everything that we talked about here, uh, you can do that by visiting our website, um, going to subscribe to reports in the top right corner. It's free, really free. You just have to provide some basic information about your network. Uh, contact us through your, through, through your domain, uh, work domain basically, um, and, and provide us some information that we can use to verify um, whether you really are the owner of, uh, of, of the network that, that you say you are. So really easy uh, to, to check out. And that's it. Um, we have a lot of slides as usual, uh, as in any shadow server presentation, but I hope it was a pretty good overview of, of the scanning IPv4, IPv6, and, um, and the device fingerprinting that we have introduced. So thank you very much. Hello. So Kauta from Elisa. So asking related to the, I would say, the equipment database that you have collected. This means that you have now a capability to 
flash scan the, net, uh, the in whole internet, for example, if you find a new exchange vulnerability and you want, want to identify w which versions are out there, so you can da do that basically in within half an hour, maybe. Well, we, we could Considering that you have the, all the data, I mean, you don't have to scan the whole net. You just well, need to bring on all the IP addresses you know where there, there has been an exchange server or... or yeah, so, so at a given point in time, every day we do know where all the certain servers are, right? Like exchange or, 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 or others, right? So that makes it easier to scan, obviously, with a hit list. Uh, the scanning is not necessarily perfect because it's not dedicated just to being uh, an exchange, in, in this case, in your example, we actually do have an exchange scan, but let's say a Fortinet scan, which I used, used before. We don't have a dedicated Fortinet scan, right? So we know there are Fortinets there, but we don't necessarily know the version, right? Because they are not dedicated. So we would need to do a subsequent scan to more, more uh, a deeper scan to try to identify the version. That is, that is true. However, uh, Dave can scan the internet very, very quickly. So yes. <laughs> I would say if needed, we probably could Spin up a scan if we since we know the population if if we know what the um, if we know what page we're looking for to scrape the information probably could do it in a, probably uh, probably an hour or two uh, with a little bit of dev time but it wouldn't be wouldn't be too terribly bad to do with the dev time right yeah it take a little bit of dev time but yeah. it's not it's probably not terrible so so do you, does your uh, normal dedicated scans you anyway anyway record the version numbers. If it's available, without. if it's available, yes, we do. Yeah. Uh, Carlos from the Portuguese Academic CERT. Uh, well, first, thank you for the presentation. The data you send uh, daily on a daily basis, and uh, I got a bit concerned about the slide where you have shown that you, you have said uh, no uh, laws of the U.S. are being broken. So. Uh, you are not saying no laws of uh, US and EU are being broken. So sh should we uh, worry about this? No. Um, we just say we say no laws in the US being broken because that is where we, that's where the scanning cluster is hosted. Uh, we take great pains to not break any law when possible. Um, I shouldn't even say when possible. I just don't want to break the law. There's, there's, there's no point in doing that. If we are breaking the law, then the, the scan is not worth running. Yeah, so just to be clear, none of the scans involve exploitation of any kind, right? So they are mostly hello scans, or if we can find a way to grab a version without actually, or determining if something is vulnerable without actually exploiting it, that's what we do. There are certain scans which we could do, but we never do because they would actually involve like reading a bit of memory uh, from a device, for example, or essentially um, breaching, uh, essentially uh, exploiting a vulnerability, right? So this is, this is what we never do, right? Um, as Dave said, we scan from the U.S., so we are focused on, on not breaking U.S. laws, but to our knowledge, we are also not breaking any, any other European laws either, and we certainly wouldn't want to break any. Um, that, that, is, that is for sure, right? So we have never had a problem with it, actually. The, the, so. the other detail I, I was worrying also is it seems that you are doing the scans only from one location with two uh, 10 gig uh, links. Mm -hmm. So uh, if, if it's kind of easy to attack this location because it's just one location. So you, uh, do you have any plans to, uh, in, in some way, uh, have diverse locations so the, the, the resilience uh, goes, uh, improves? It would be interesting to do, um, but I mean, it's, it's definitely possible to do, but the problem is that uh, it requires money and a lot of it okay. because the, uh, the, the, the scanning cluster requires a lot of, uh, a lot of metal to actually run. Yeah, so I mean, if, if somebody would like to fund it, then definitely <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a fantastic option. Um, we do experience DDoS attacks, but it's never really been that that's hampered our operations. Uh, we do have other types of attacks like uh, UDP poisoning, where for the UDP scans that we reach out, that we send out, uh, someone spoofs responses and then we end up reporting false positives. So that's something that does happen, but that will happen regardless of location, right? So yeah. mm -hmm. that's, Thank you. that's, that's, yeah. Okay, let, let, let me make you your last, your last I'll question. make you short, but uh, you must have really interesting jobs, I think. But I'm just curious, uh, have you considered using ASICs to offload the, the CPUs 
for either RT6 scanning or something else? Maybe an ASIC on the network card or something? No, uh, we haven't, to be honest. Um, we've just done everything basically just on metal, and it's worked so far. But it probably would be not be a bad idea to look down that route. But it, if, you've done, if you've been doing this for eight years, mm -hmm. then you could have uh, probably gotten a bit of value out of either bought ASICs or programmable ASICs. Or, yeah. Uh, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let us thank the speakers again. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And uh, please remember uh, fill the survey in your mobile app. And uh, that's it for today. Thank you. <laughs>